it says, These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I pray, will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world, and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things. And needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Two weeks ago, I told you that a burdened people, a loving people, a committed people, a passionate people, a focused people, are five marks of a missionary-minded church. However, there are five more marks that we are going to look at today from the intercessory prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17 for his church. You see, Jesus was with those apostles that made up the very first New Testament church. If you'll remember, he put first apostles in the church according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So Jesus, before his cru crucifixion, was in the upper room with his church, eating and washing their feet. He warned, instructed, and gave them a new commandment to love in John chapter 13. He told them that he was the way, the truth, and the life. And then told them about the promise of the Holy Spirit. He taught them how to stay connected to him and how to be fruitful in the Christian life. He then reminds them, his church, of the world's hatred and coming persecution. I think it's interesting. The apostle said, Jesus, we believe you came from God. And Jesus questioned their sincerity by asking, do you really believe then in John chapter 17, Jesus just begins to pray for the kind of church he hoped for them to be. Now, before continuing today, may I remind you we are in a 12-month sermon series entitled, Transformed, Becoming a Transformational Church. The old scorecard was about bodies, budgets, and buildings. But the new scorecard is about discerning, embracing, and engaging. So let's continue today to discern if we, the Indianapolis Baptist Temple, has a missionary mentality or not, and what it takes, if we don't, to have one and to keep one. You see, in Jesus' intercessory prayer in John 17, he gives us more marks of a missionary-minded church. So today, let's begin. The Bible says in John chapter 17, beginning with verse number 1, these words spake Jesus and lifted up the, his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. 
I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Those are the apostles. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. The, the church needs to keep his word. The church needs to keep the faith. The church needs not to depart from the faith. Then Jesus says in verse 7, Now they have spoken that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou, hast gave, which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them, which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. This morning, a missionary-minded church, I want you to know, has five more marks. There's 15 altogether. We've looked at five. Let me show you five more from this intercessory prayer of Jesus in John 17. Because he tells us as he prays for the apostles, as he prays for his church, as he prays for us, that he wants us to be missionary-minded. You see, he was about to send these apostles out into the world, and likewise, he has sent us out into the world. He was about to send his first church out into the world, and he was praying for them, and he wants to send us, us out into the world, and he likewise is praying for us today, I believe. So let me give you five marks, five more marks of a missionary-minded church. Number one, it is a united people. The Bible says in verse 11 and 12, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, but Judas, but the son of ruin and destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. I want you to know that Jesus tells us a missionary-minded church in this prayer, this intercessory prayer, is a united church. People. He wants us to be one doing the work that he has called us to do. He has, he, has, he has called his church out of this world to be united, to be one, to go into the world to preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, being one doesn't mean we all are exactly the same because we are all different. We all have different gifts and different thoughts and different abilities and, and different ideas about things. So what does it mean to be one? What does it mean to be unified? Well, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1, So we being many are one body in Christ and everyone members of one another. That is speaking about a local church. It's not speaking about all, un, all saved people all around the world, wherever they may be today. It's talking about local New Testament assemblies. So we being many are one body in Christ. We are one local church and everyone members of one of another and in the local church as members we need to be united the Bible goes on in Romans 15 in verse 6 and tells us that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ we may all be different today but together as one body we need to rise up and we need to sing and we need to give and we need to worship and we need to serve and we need to obey and I want you to know that we as members of the local church that Jesus is praying for needs to be united in our vision and in our mission that he has called us to the Bible also says in 1 Corinthians 10, 17, For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. 
He goes on in, in, in chapter 12, in verse 12, and he says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that body, of that one body being many, are one body, so also is Christ. He says in verse 13, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Many teach that this is some kind of spirit baptism, but I want you to know that it's not speaking of spirit baptism. It's speaking of water baptism, that the Spirit of God has led you to this local church to be saved and to be baptized, immersed into water because we are one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit. He goes on in verse 20 and says, But now are they many members, yet but one body, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. How can this not be the local church? Because only a local church body can care for one another. I, I can't care for somebody else. I can't care for someone over in Russia. I can't care for someone down in Mexico. I can't care for someone like I, 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 I can care for those in my body, in my local church. Verse 20 says, But now are they many members, yet but one body, that there should be no schism in the body. So we shouldn't fight and argue. We, we, we need to get along. We need to be united. We need to be one in the efforts that God has called us to. You see, I don't have to agree with you on everything. You don't have to agree with me on everything. But there's one thing that we have to agree on. God has sent us into the world to preach his gospel. And we have, we must agree on that. We must come together on those things. You see, we are a united people here's the point this morning a missionary minded church is a united people we are of one body to glorify God to care for one another to rid ourselves of divisions to stay in the body not to depart from the body or from the faith listen don't become a son of perdition don't become a son of ruin don't become a son of destruction being a church member is like being married we are to be one body all the husbands look at your wives today and say we are to be one body go ahead this is your opportunity you may never get it again look at her again and say we are to be one body I would ask the women to do it but it wouldn't help so men look at your wives and say we are to be one body And it takes a lot of work to continue to be one body. And in the local church, it takes a lot of work to stay and become and continue to be one body. Until we are united and one inwardly, we'll never be one outwardly. A missionary-minded church is a united people. In Jesus' intercessory prayer of John 17, he also tells us that a missionary-minded church is not only a united people, but also it is a joyful people. The Bible says, beginning with verse number 13, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil in the world. They, verse 16, are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I want you to know that even though this world gets to be a difficult place to be sometimes, we can be joyful 
as we do God's work, as we serve him, as we are the church that he's praying for us to be to the Father, I want you to know that no matter the persecution that might come, the hardships that might come, the difficulties that might come, I want you to know that we can be a joyful people. I believe the Indianapolis Baptist Temple is a joyful people. I believe over the last 14 years and through all of our battles, we have remained a joyful people. Uh, there was an article written uh, about us uh, a few years ago, and uh, 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 an editor came to the service, and, and he, 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 he sat in our service, and he listened to the music, and he heard the preaching, and, and uh, he talked to the people, and, and he went back, and, and he wrote an article, and he said, I saw no hatred. I saw no bitterness. I saw a group of people trying to serve the Lord. And you know what? That is the kind of people we need to remain to be. A missionary-minded church is a joyful people. A joyful people. You do know <coughs> that uh, there is a difference between happy people and joyful people, do you not? Happy people need a happening. My children, my four daughters, when they were growing up, uh, to make them happy, there had to be a happening. I now have two grandsons. To make them happy, there has to be a happening. We, we, we've had our grandsons uh, with us for several days because uh, of Scott doing work at the house, and, and uh, Sh uh, Shannon has been with us. Let there be light. Uh, Shannon has, now I can, now I, I hope I read the right thing this morning because I wasn't sure. I wouldn't have said anything, but it was so obvious. Because now I can't even see you. But I can't see my Bible now. But they've been staying with us. And uh, Lincoln, he needs a happening to be happy. Pops, can you play cards? Pops, can you play scramble? Pops, can you play this? Pops, can we watch TV? Pops, can we do this? Pops, can we do that? And as long as I'm, I'm wearing myself out and giving him a happening, he's happy. But when I say, oh, Pops, he's, he's, he's a little tired, he's not happy anymore. There's a difference between being happy and being joyful. The truth is you can't do enough to make and keep people happy. You can't do enough to keep your grandsons happy. You can't do enough to keep your children happy. We, we, we better develop joyfulness in their lives because there is a difference joyful people are always joyful because joyful people have the word of God joyful people are not of this world joyful people are protected from the evil of this world joyful people know their place in this world Jesus prays and says I want my church to be joyful so a missionary-minded church is not only a united people, a joyful people, but Jesus tells us something else here in John chapter 17. He says a missionary-minded church is also a holy people. In verse 17, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Verse 19, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. We need, as the Indianapolis Baptist Temple, to be a holy people. We'll never be the missionary-minded church that we need to be. We'll never go out into this world and preach the gospel and reach people for Christ as we ought to if we are not a holy, sanctified, separate, godly people. May I say holy people are not judgmental people. We get that mixed up sometimes. Holy people are not sanctimonious people. Hate to be around sanctimonious people. Can't, can't even hardly stomach to be around them, much, much less even look at them because they've got that, that, that look on their face. And it just says, I'm better than you. I'm holier than you. You see, you see, Holy people are not hypocritical people because sanctimonious people are hypocritical people. A 
At least he brought his Bible. At least it's the King James Bible. Swallow that thing, Robin. <laughs> Sit on it. Stomp it. David, show me how to turn that baby off. Heather, show them how to turn that off. We need a woman. A woman in charge. That's what we need right now. Holy people are not judgmental people. Holy people are not sanctimonious people. Holy people are not hypocritical people. Holy people are not holier than thou people. Holy people are not even old-fashioned people. Today, let me give to you some scriptures and thoughts on holiness. Number one, we are elected to holiness. Romans 8, 29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We are called to holiness in 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness we are created in holiness for Ephesians 4 24 tells us and that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness we are possessed by holiness first Corinthians 3 know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you if any man defile the temple of God he shall God him 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 shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Not only that, we are to be holy in our bodies. For Romans 6.13 says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Not only that, we are to be holy in our manner of life, according to Peter in 1 Peter 1.15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation or manner of life. Another word for holiness today is godliness, holy living. So godliness is profitable, 1 Timothy 4, 7. But refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Godliness should be pursued, 1 Timothy 6. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Godliness is our duty. For Titus in uh, chapter 2 and, and verse number 12 says it like this. Teaching us that. Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Sanctification is another good word for holiness, for godliness. It means growing in holiness. And sanctification is produced by God. Sanctification is produced by Christ. Sanctification is produced by the Holy Spirit. Sanctification is produced by truth. It's produced by Christ's blood. Sanctification is produced by prayer. Sanctification is produced by, word, by the Word. We are to be a holy people as we go out into the world and be an example of what the world needs to be like. There's a fourth mark, though, found here in John chapter 17, Christ's intercessory prayer for his church. And he also tells us that a missionary-minded church is something else. A missionary-minded church, he tells us, is a sent people. Verse 18, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Look at verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me 
through their word. And then he says in verse 21, He says in verse 21 that they all may be one as thou art in me and I in thee that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Listen to that. A missionary minded church is a sent people sent people one gentleman wrote and he said this and I quote as God sent the son into the world so we are at the core a sent or simply a missionary people this sending is embodied and lived out in the missional impulse this is in essence an outwardly bound movement from one community or individual to another it is the outward thrust rooted in God's mission that compels the church to reach a lost world. Therefore, <clears throat> a genuine missional impulse is a sending rather than a attractual one. Did you catch that? What are churches doing today to reach the lost, to grow? We are trying to attract people. And there's a certain amount of, tra of attracting that we tried to do this morning. Uh, there's nothing wrong with having a good image. There's nothing wrong with trying to have the best band, the best singers, the best singing. Uh, th there's nothing wrong with trying to present the, the best message that you can bring from God's Word. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, with having the buildings cleaned and having the bathrooms cleaned. We, we are trying to attract people. We, we, we don't want people to come in here and say, man, this place is a mess. I don't want to come back. I don't want to come back next week or even stay today. There, there's a certain thing that we do to attract. Ladies, there are certain things that you do to attract your husband before he's your husband. Do we... Must we go into all that this morning? It would be fun. But we'd have to be here for at least another hour and a half. But it would be fun. There are certain things, ladies, that you did to attract your husband. And once you attracted him, and once you got him, sometimes you stop doing those things that initially made him attracted to you. <clears throat> just, that, that halls, I just need that halls today. <clears throat> you fixed up. Put on makeup. You fixed him dinner. You, you did things to attract him. You say, now that I got him, I don't need to attract him anymore. I've got him. That's a lie from the pits of hell. That's a lie from the from the the the, the, the feminism movement. Have you, ever, have you ever seen the women that lead that feminism movement? A dog wouldn't be attracted to them, they're so ugly. No wonder they're in the feminism movement. Lord have mercy, they're atrocious looking. That gal that started Planned Parenthood, Lord have mercy. Who would even want to touch her, much less look at her? <clears throat> I've noticed lately, though, they put more pretty girls up in front. I've noticed that lately. What are they doing? They're trying to attract you. They're trying to seduce you. What was my wife doing while we were dating? She was trying to seduce me. I've got one message for today. Please keep trying. Don't stop now. Don't give up. I still got a lot of fire in this belly. There's, there's nothing wrong with attracting and continuing to attract. 
But the church is not just to be attractive and attract people. We are to get up and leave this place today because we are a sent people. Jesus brought us into this world not just to attract people, but he brought us together to be sent into this world, to be sent into all the world. That's why I went to a, a church planning conference last week in Orlando, Florida, other than the fact that it was warm. The spiritual reason is because it was a church planning conference. And it was a great conference. And I'm encouraged. And I came back encouraged. Before I even got back, I started texting Matt, and I started texting Ellery, and I started texting Wanda, and I started texting Carol, and I started texting everybody. We want to attract. But more than that, we need to be a sent people. We need to leave this place today and go into the world and individually we need to share Christ with those that we come in contact with. We're to be a sent people. But not only that, a missionary-minded church <clears throat> is a like-minded people. Look at verse 22. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be per made perfect in one, and that the world may know, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. Verse 26, and I have declared unto them thy name, and I will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. We need to be a like minded people together sharing the love of God together sharing in Christ's glory together sharing